When the New York Jets met with Aaron Rodgers, the question everyone was asking was, well, why would they do that if there wasn't a deal agreed to in principle? The latest reporting suggests there was and the Jets backed out. No wonder the two sides seem to be dug in at the moment. Plus, we go over some scenarios with the Green Bay Packers and the upcoming NFL Draft. All of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You were Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet and the show for fans who know what happened. They want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. A pretty explosive report from Charles Robinson in a a local radio interview yesterday provides some incredible insight into what has gone on over the last few weeks. Rewind a second. In the morning, we got a report from Adam Schefter. He said, It is now possible that there is no trade before the draft because the two sides are dug in and that they have not had communication over the last few weeks since the NFL owners' meetings. And this, I think, could have been taken as just a sign that, okay, um, they're, they're just waiting until we get closer to the draft. The draft is still two weeks away. And so we don't really have to worry about this stuff right now. Deadline, spur action, all of that stuff, right? But then this report that the Packers and the Jets had a deal in principle. And it was 90% done. And the Jets go out and meet with Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers gives his interview with Pat McAfee about a week later, um, and that spooks Woody Johnson. The 90% retired comment spooks Woody Johnson, and he does not want to give up a bona fide first round pick in the future and wants conditions and, and you know whatever, all sorts of insurance in the future here. And what Charles Robinson suggests is that the Packers are asking for a second in this year's draft, a a no doubt future first round pick in 2024, and that they are willing to send draft compensation back to the Jets. This, for the moment, has not been accepted. And the little color in there is that the Packers may be willing to go with a third this year with that guaranteed future first. Now, the Jets don't have a third this year, so you'd have to come up with what you think the value of that pick would be and move forward. Now, I think there are all sorts of ways that you can look at this and say, okay, actually, there are some pretty straightforward compromises. If a second and a future first is essentially what the deal was originally, what was agreed to, and the, with with whatever conditional pick and Robinson in his original Yahoo report suggests a third round pick back if Aaron Rodgers does not play in 2024 beyond. Okay, and remember that is the pick that was in the Joe Montana deal. The 49ers sent the third round pick to get the first from Kansas City and the Joe Montana deal 30 years ago as it may be was a template that the Packers had set forth to the Jets when trying to look at what they thought fair value for this deal was. The obvious compromise to me is to put simple but straightforward and achievable conditions on that first round pick. 
And Robinson suggested a future second with um, incentive-based performance, you know, uh, escalators there, you know, much like the, the Brett Favre trade was where, okay, it's a first if they win the Super Bowl. Can't do that. Can't do that. Especially when this deal was agreed upon. And so this is the bad faith part of this. And there was a reporter in New York who went on TV and said, this is the Packers negotiating in bad faith and they backed out of a deal. And it turns out the other the other way around. That what happened is they had a deal and Woody Johnson, as billionaires are wont to do in these situations, because they like to get their way, they're used to getting their way, um, said, mm, I'm nervous. And so we need to get some more conditions on this when it's on the one yard line. I know that the Jets are not used to scoring in the low red zone. And so they're they're just like, they don't know what to do when they get close to the goal line. They, they don't know how to get the ball into the end zone when they're that close to the goal line. But it sounds like they reneged on this deal. And so if you have already agreed that this is the value of Aaron Rodgers, now, okay, understanding that you think it's going to be for two years and now you're not sure you're getting two years, presumably you talked to Rodgers and he told you, yeah, if things go well in year one, I'd love to be able to play year two. If you're still spooked now, this leaking is going to have Aaron Rodgers calling Woody Johnson like, hey man, WTF. I thought we we had an agreement and now all of a sudden if you're ownership, if you're the front office, you have already pissed off this quarterback that you are trying to bring to town because he's going, well, I told you. And even if it is entirely reasonable for ownership, for the front office, for whomever to be like, I don't know if we can trust this guy to, to be a man of his word. That is totally reasonable. It is not the best way to handle this to go back on a deal that was agreed to, at least nearly agreed to in principle and say, actually, conditions, conditions, there's all these conditions that need to be met. So now we're we're getting into a situation where now I understand the Packers digging in. Now I understand David Bakhtiari going, I think the Packers might, out of pettiness and spite, just keep Aaron Rodgers. Because the Jets... That seemed, when he said that, and we talked about it on the show yesterday, that seemed totally ridiculous to me. Like, totally, completely, and entirely ridiculous to me. But, the reality is, if the Packers and the Jets had a deal, and that deal was was undermined or just pulled out of by the Jets to add additional conditions, when... That's that's not how this works. I can understand the Packers going, this is BS. This is nonsense. This is not how you negotiate in good faith. And saying, okay, now we're going to make this hurt. That we, are, we can actually, again, if this goes past the draft, then the Packers can hold Aaron Rodgers hostage and say, we will trade him to you August 30th. And we don't care if it's for a fifth round pick. We don't care if it's for nothing. We are going to torpedo your season because if he doesn't show up until the week before the season starts, you are boned. Like, it just isn't going to work. We know with Aaron Rodgers, it just isn't going to work if he is just meeting these guys for the first time. And you can say, oh, well, they'll throw together on the side. Well, if they don't know in June and July if this trade is actually going to get done, First of all, Rodgers, yeah, Rodgers is working with Lazard, but you got to get with Garrett Wilson. You got to get with Brees Hall. You got to get with this offensive line, which by the way, is still not very good. You, th- there's a lot of moving pieces here. And if he can't be in camp and he can't get those reps, it is going to be very difficult to get up to speed in a brutal AFC, in a brutal AFC East. They are not going to have time to spare. They don't have six weeks to get up to speed. Because it's not like the Buccaneers with Tom Brady where you throw him in there and you need six to eight weeks to get up to speed. But then once you're up to speed, you become, because you are the most talented team in the conference, the favorites. That's not what's going on with the Jets. You get up to speed in the conference, you are still chasing the Chiefs, the Bengals, the Bills. 
maybe even the Dolphins, depending on what kind of quarterback play they get. So this, this is an ugly situation right now. Now, again, the compromise here is, okay, if everyone agrees a second this year and everyone agrees that a first-round pick on the high end of outcomes makes sense for 2024, it is interesting to me that in the report, Charles Robinson said the the Packers would be willing to do a third this year if it means a guaranteed future first or a third in value. They want that 2024 first. And to me, that says two things. One, they need insurance if Jordan Love doesn't work out. And two, they think there's a chance that they could pull a Detroit Lions or a Seattle Seahawks. That this goes off the rails. That a Russell Wilson-like situation. And that is exactly what Woody Johnson is worried about. That they, they trade for Aaron Rodgers and they end up with Russell Wilson, and this is a top five pick in 2024. This is exactly why he doesn't want to do this. Because if it doesn't go well, and you're giving up a future first, that's baked into the performance that you get from Rodgers. And you get 2022 20, Aaron Rodgers. This is an 8-9 win team, and you might give you might be giving up a top 15 pick. And if it's a little worse if an injury to his ribs or his thumb keeps him out, then all of a sudden, maybe it's a six, maybe it's a seven win season and you're giving up a top 10 pick. I get why Woody Johnson would want to hedge his bets. The problem is, it seems like they already agreed to a deal that the Packers already know that the Jets believe there is this value. And so for the Packers to be saying, okay, it's a second, it's a future second that be, that can become a first if, and you make those ifs, those qualifiers, not Super Bowl, not even, I don't, wouldn't even say make the playoffs. I would say make it like the Carson Wentz deal. It's a second this season. It's a future first. And that future first is if Aaron Rodgers plays 75% of snaps. If Aaron Rodgers plays 75% of snaps, chances are that that pick is not going to be in the top 15. Like that, there's a good chance. And so that is your insurance. And you're willing to say, and here's some stuff in 2025 if Aaron Rodgers doesn't play in 2024. That is a reasonable compromise, but at the same time, we have to, we, we number one, we have, to, we have to know the Packers are willing to come back to the table because they could be scorned at this point. They could feel slighted and jilted and be going, screw this. And, or... We need to know that the Jets are willing to come back to the table and negotiate here. We know that they they want and need Aaron Rodgers. The question is, are they willing to do it before the draft? And that becomes the next pivot point. That becomes the next point where you go, okay, now when you have to actually make those picks, are you willing to say, okay, I'd rather make this pick than trade for Aaron Rodgers? And that's where this gets complicated. That's where this gets complicated. And so... This is this this does not tell us we're any closer to uh, a trade. It sounds like we were actually very close, as Trey Wingo reported. He was on the show that that it was close. It was close. It was basically done. And and it sounds like again, I have to couch this because this is just what the report is. But I trust Charles Robinson more than I trust almost any other reporter, honestly, in the NFL media. Um, and it sounds like the Jets backed up. That is a bad look for the Jets. It is a bad message to send to the quarterback that you are trying to woo. There there may have to be some fence mending there. And for the Packers, it might cause them to go scorched earth or at the very least to say, okay, if the best pick we're going to get out of them is a third this year and what they actually have to end up doing is cobbling together some pick swaps and a couple, you know, a fourth round pick and, and whatever, the, 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 the difference in pick swaps in the second round is not really that much. And the difference in the first round, like that's not going to get you there. It can't just be 13 for 15 and 42 for 45. Like that's a that's a low third round pick in net value. So that's not going to get you there. Um, although, you know, maybe it is good enough in the moment. If Jackson Smith the Jigba, let's say, is there at 13 and this trade's not done, it might, might be enough um, to, to move up and get him. We're going to talk about that, the draft part of this in a second. But then if that's the asset that you're haggling over, then you wait until after the draft, you save the money on the cap this year, and 
you do things like extend Rashawn Gary and front load that deal um, because you're all of a sudden you've got money to play with, 15 extra million versus the trade um, pre-June 1, and you, you make it hurt. You make it hurt, and you still have to get that future first-round pick. You still are going to get that pick because the Jets have already told you they are willing to value Aaron Rodgers at that price. And so if they are going to negotiate in good faith, then that deal has to continue to be the bones of this deal. You can't just suddenly make up new stuff. That's not how this works. All right, we're going to talk about the draft portion of this in just a second. Before we do, let's talk about Bilt Bar. Looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories? Then you have to try the best-tasting protein bar ever. Um, I eat them basically every day. Is one of those beautiful things where they they became a, a sponsor of Locked On Packers and it was an easy thing to immediately adapt into my routine because they deliver on the promise of something that is not only delicious, and it is covered in 100% real chocolate, but it comes in flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream. The cookies and cream puff is here. Go get one. But it's got the macros that you want. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. That is what you want. Plus now, you go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club and pick up specialty flavors at Built.com as well. You have so many options now. You do not have an excuse to not try Built Bar. Go and check it out for yourself today. So we have this NFL Draft newsletter. Um, you can go sign up to it, lockedonpodcast.com slash newsletters. And it is all NFL Draft stuff. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. And I, I hope you will go and check it out along with uh, The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Um, we uh, we did a lot of, I did a more sort of, um, if you're a more visual person, a lot of the breakdown we did yesterday, finding the perfect Packers draft picks, the guy that hit all of the, the tiers, um, that stuff is broken down very easily in our newsletter on The Leap. But this is from um, our NFL draft newsletter. Again, lockedonpodcasts.com slash newsletters to check this out. And what they did was they did a mock based on the most common mock pairings from around the internet. So it is predictive based on who um, the consensus, you know, this is a wisdom of the crowds kind of thing, are, are pairing players and, and, and team pairings. At 15, this mock has Lucas Van Ness, the pass rusher from Iowa, who, as you will remember yesterday, is about as close to a perfect fit in terms of athletic profile as the Packers, um, for the Packers as you could be without actually being perfect. He's just like, just, 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 um, I don't, I don't think that is the guy at 15. I just don't think that is, I, I personally do not value him in that spot. I would get it. Premium position, premium athlete, um, pedigree in terms of the conference that he played in, the competition that he went against, and I think has the, the kind of game where you could play him inside, um, you can play him at five tech if you wanted, you could, you could do a lot of different things with him in this Packers defense, and so much like the case for Rashawn Gary, although I don't have him graded in that range, I would understand the pick. The question is, for me, when I look at these is, okay, who did they not draft that I think is more likely to be the pick? I look at 17 to Pittsburgh, Darnell Wright. I actually don't think he's going to be a Packers type. He'd be the heaviest offensive lineman that they drafted since the Super Bowl. I just, I don't think he's a great fit in the run game. He is a hell of a pass protector. And maybe if they're going to go to more gap and power schemes, like, yeah, cool. He's your, I, I think he is going to be a 10-year right tackle. I don't think he's ideally suited for the Packers and not not quite the kind of profile that they tend to look for in the scheme that they run. Both the tight ends come off the board after Dalton Kincaid at 21, Michael Mayer at 26. That seems to be the consensus is that they are, they're going to go off in the 20s. And so if you're the Packers and you're sitting there at 15 going, I don't love the options here. You have these two tight ends that you like. 
I think you can you can move down and and this is this is where I think this is this kind of thing is important. And teams do look at this stuff. I remember John Harbaugh saying, "We read mock drafts. These front offices do project, and they look at mocks to project, and they should. They should because it there is um, some, some useful forecasting in there, and we we know we have data, we have historical evidence that." knowing consensus and and not straying from consensus actually makes you less likely to miss on a player. The further you go from consensus, the smarter you think you are relative to the wisdom of the crowds, the more likely you are to miss. Now, I'm not saying never do it, but understand what the risk profile is. So if it seems like there are these tight ends. And if you think these tight ends are similarly graded. Now, I think Dalton Kincaid is clearly better than Michael Mayer. He's also older. He also has no athletic profile because he has not tested. But Adam Schefter reported clean bill of health. He's been cleared and has a meeting with the Packers. Another one of these top 50 players. at, at or there, there are top 30 visits, but top 50 players. Just want to be clear on that. That is a top 50 tight end. Darnell Washington has already been a top 30 visit. Dalton Kincaid is set to be another one. Just keep an eye on these because they've telegraphed this over the last few years. Same way that they have telegraphed it a little bit, at least positions of interest with who they're talking to at the combine. I I think it makes sense for them to go Detroit at 18. Could they trade up for a quarterback if Will Levis is still there at 15? The Buccaneers, the Seahawks, 1920. That's the perfect range because it's not going to take a lot for those guys to move up. You add a day three pick, and now you can still get your tight end. You're ahead of the Chargers, who might be looking for a tight end, um, and you're ahead of the Cowboys at 26, who might be looking for a tight end. You're ahead of the Bengals at 28, who might be looking for a tight end. So that is a good range. Plus, there's two. So if you have them graded pretty similarly, and again, I have Kincaid clearly better than Mayer, but but like I they're they're in terms of where I would draft them, they're both first round guys. Like I think Kincaid is clearly a better player, but I don't think the difference in their quality is so much that I would definitely um, you know, I would have to draft the one and be, you know, brutal about drafting the other one. I don't I don't think that's the case. Players that I think the Packers might want that go ahead of where they're picking. And this is one of those funny things. Um, the most common player for both the Raiders and the Falcons was Christian Gonzalez. So he actually gets drafted in this mock twice. So in a way, it almost doesn't make even sense for Lucas Van Ness to be there because it could be someone else. He could have he could go a spot higher. Uh, Miles Murphy, nine to Chicago, makes a lot of sense to me. Paris Johnson Jr., um, to Philadelphia makes a lot of sense to me. Jackson Smith the Jigba at 11. I I actually don't see that one. I think they have to draft an offensive lineman. Their offensive line is a disaster. Um, and it seems like Mike Vrabel did not like the way that things played out last year with the A.J. Brown trade and, and bringing in Traylon Burks. Did not like Malik Willis. Did not like anything that Brian Robinson did as GM. That's why he is out and Vrabel has been elevated um, in terms of his standing in the organization. He wants to run the ball. He wants to play defense. To me, that is offensive line central. That is Broderick Jones. That is one of those guys. Well, Quinn Johnson, the receiver, Houston, um, that makes a ton of sense to me with a new quarterback. And then Broderick Jones at 13 to the Jets, Joey Porter Jr. um, to the Patriots. That could be another place for Jackson Smith to Jigba to come off the board. So if you're the Packers, again, you got to move up if JSN is your guy. You got to move up. I am I am coming to the realization more and more that I think the Packers are just not going to pick at 15. Because I think you need to go up to get JSN. If you can't, and it's very very possible that you just can't, that you just can't get the right deal. And he or he goes with Chris Olave. Like the Packers were trying to move up for Chris Olave. He just ended up going a lot higher than they could reasonably get. That could happen. Like Seattle could take him at five. 
and you just never had a shot to get up that high because if you did, now there's teams with you know calling about quarterbacks. Who knows what the situation there is? So I think it makes more sense if those if if you are trying to get Jackson Smith to Jigba, and that is I am JSN no matter what at this point. Go get that guy, get a tight end on day two, and figure the rest out. If you can't, if you can't, if the price just gets out of control, I am finding it hard to see one of these guys. I think the off, I think the good offensive linemen who also are fits for Green Bay will be gone. Paris Johnson Jr., Broderick Jones. I think those guys are going to be gone. And Pete Skaronsky, not my guy. Um, by the way, he's not actually in this mock. So the Raiders and the Falcons maybe just have to split, like give Skaronsky to one of those guys. Um, because he must, he must just not be a player who's mocked that often to any one singular team. I don't think he's a fit for Green Bay either, because I think he's a guard, and he might even be a center. I just am having trouble seeing how it plays out at 15, where they have their preferred options, guys like Miles Murphy, Paris Johnson Jr., and and I don't think JSN is going to fall. So then it's can you trade back, and can you trade back in a position where you can still get one of those tight ends at a day two pick and and feel like you're maximizing your value. To me, those are the two scenarios that make the most sense right now. Now, things can happen. Things get weird. I think this is going to be a potentially profoundly weird draft because the difference between the 11th best player in this draft and the 60th best player is like zero. So that is going to mean that there are going to be a lot of weird picks, including it could be the Green Bay Packers. They could make a weird pick too. It's been known to happen. All right, we're going to finish up here. But before we do, thanks for making Locked on Packers your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked on NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes. From free agency to the draft, salary cap management, and more, join NFL experts Kyle Crabb and Joe Marino as they take you through what it's like to build a successful NFL franchise every Monday through Friday. Find Locked on NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. So... This is getting frustrating with the Aaron Rodgers stuff. And I get that. And I'm I'm sorry. I really am. I wish that we had answers here. And I had a really fun back and forth with Zach Cruz. And it was about, you know, culpability and how the Packers could be painted as the bad guy and all this stuff. And I, you know, I said, he made a comment about how, you know, everyone wants this. And if the Packers... Um, are holding it up, they're going to look like the bad guys. And I said, okay, well, th- everyone wants this. And if the Jets are going to hold this up, they're going to look like the bad guys. And Jake Morley, our pal, quote tweeted this and was like, well, they're both right. And that's why this is annoying. And and that's exactly right. Until. Until we found out one team was actually being far more annoying than the other. It seemed like both sides were just being stubborn. Now it seems like that's not the case. And so I'm fascinated to see how the how the burden shifts here. And I just wonder if the reports from earlier today and now this Charles Robinson report lights a fire, if it's a little embarrassing for Woody Johnson, which it is, and that makes him go, okay, look, let's just let's just get this done. Because I can't be seen to be arguing in bad faith and discussing in bad faith. I just can't, I can't, that is. It hurts the Jets in negotiations with future trades, future GMs, future other organizations. And it is a reminder that it takes two teams to make a trade. You always wonder why the Packers can't, why can't they, why do they, they get close, but no cigar. Well, because these other teams have owners and they change their mind like that. It's so it can be whimsical. They are capricious. They are billionaires who are used to having total control of everything. All the time. And not just like the kind of control that you and I think we have over our daily lives. No, control over everything in our life. It's just a different way of moving through the world that we can't even fathom. And so things like this can happen. But I just, the the Jets cannot be seen from a perception around the league standpoint that they will not negotiate in good faith especially for Aaron Rodgers. And that's where the Rodgers part of this and his ego and the, hey, I told you we're good for two years. Why are you being like this? 
comes in. And I wouldn't be surprised if these if this actual reporting is ultimately what spurs a deal to get done sooner than later. All right, we're going to be back tomorrow. Um, it, uh, we'll find something else to talk about. There's always something else to talk about. I promise. Um, and we'll find it. whatever it is. We will find it. We're still going here five days a week. Thanks for everyone who is an every day or here on the locked on Packers podcast. Um, I I've noticed an uptick in, in DMS and people asking me questions about the NFL draft. So, um, we're going to do a, a mailbag show tomorrow. Send me your questions. Could be draft related. Could be Aaron Rodgers related. Could be off season. Could be, uh, you know, my favorite fried chicken recipes. Send me your questions and let's do a mailbag. Let's have some fun. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live on a live reaction show, like when we have breaking news to discuss, I don't know what we could possibly discuss on breaking news, but if we had breaking news to discuss, we'll do that on our Locked on Packers YouTube page so you can stay Locked on Packers.